Well, in the end, you know, what you've got here is exactly what you might expect from a deal agreed by 197 countries. It is the lowest common denominator. Nobody got what they wanted. Indeed, a lot of countries left bitterly disappointed. But there is quite wide consensus. And I don't mean amongst the British presidency of this affair. I mean across the various nations and into NGOs and campaigners as well, that it does just about possibly keep that 1.5 dream alive. Well, this morning I caught up with the COP president, Alok Sharma, and asked him first off about that profound apology. Well, I think the first thing to say, Alex, is that if you look at what we've achieved here, it is absolutely historic. You know, we started out saying two years ago we want to keep 1.5 global warming uh, within reach, that limit to 1.5 degrees. We achieved that in Glasgow. It's not just me saying it. You heard that from the most climate vulnerable countries from the floor. You've heard that from uh, climate NGOs. Uh, and not only that, but we also ensured that for six years, the world had been trying to close off the final difficult elements of the Paris Agreement. We did that here True. in Glasgow. But, but, when uh, the, but, when the, but when the bosses moved to tears and expressing sorrow and regret, mm. that's a strange form of success. Well, so uh, what I would say to you is that uh, you know, I obviously have invested a lot over the last few years. I've been out to uh, countries. I've seen uh, you know, individuals, communities on the front line of climate change. Um, also, I was uh, tired, uh, not had much sleep in, in, in days. Uh, but it was emotional in that room, and you, you, you felt it. And, and you've heard people like Tina Stee from Marshall Islands saying she was uh, you know, really disappointed, uh, you know, bitterly uh, disappointed by the fact that uh, we had to change the language on coal. But it's also worth noting that for the very first time in this agreement of all the cops, the word coal does appear. And I was absolutely determined to do that. I was absolutely but determined to keep see, that word in. You can see how a normal person outside of COP would say, that's insane. You've taken all these years, not you personally, you've taken all these years just to say coal is the problem, oil is the problem, gas is the problem. That's not a sign of success. That's a sign of how cumbersome and, and frankly, pathetic this process is. Well, th these are multilateral processes. We're trying to get agreement amongst almost 200 countries. I believe the reason we were able to get this over the line, even with that change right at the end of the 11th hour, is because of the trust that we have built over the last two years around the world with countries. I was able to go to countries and say to them, this is the change that uh, China, India want. Uh, you know, is this something that you guys can, 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 can go with? Uh, people were really disappointed. There's no doubt about that. You, you, but, were, bla but you were blackmailed. They, were saying, they said to you, look, they said to you, if you don't do this, this whole process collapses. That's what they well, said. Well, uh, right, well, well, they did. Alex. Come on, right? they did. At the start of this process, if you had uh, uh, said to me that uh, uh, there is no chance of you getting coal in the language, I suspect lots of people would have agreed with you. People were really sceptical that we would ever get coal into this, uh, this uh, pact. And, we, and, we, and we, will, we, will, we will faithfully yeah. report yeah. that. But the fact is, that's what they said. They said to you, you do this or the whole process is off, didn't they? Yeah, sure. Fine, fine. That's, that's clear. That. Let's talk about the language, though. What does phasing down mean? Doesn't, it means do what you can, doesn't it? But we're in a crisis. We are in a crisis, but I think there is a renewed sense of urgency here. We heard that from the world leaders that came. The fact that we agreed this historic agreement, the Glasgow Climate Pact, uh, I think it says that the world is taking this really seriously. Uh, but the issue is whether people will deliver on their commitments in time. Uh, and that's why, again, for the very first time, we have got into this agreement the commitment from countries to come back next year to tell us how they're getting on with their 2030 emission reduction targets, those NDCs that people talk about, nationally determined contributions. Uh, we also agree that every year there will be a high-level meeting of ministers looking at this particular issue, and every year there will be a report produced uh, by the UN on how countries are doing. That is historic. We got that here in Glasgow. Of course, big steps, and, that, and, they, are, and they are there and will be reported. But the US, the EU, couldn't even set up a fund for the likes of Tuvalu and the Marshall Islands to be protected when the hurricanes come with ever greater intensity. You've seen them yourself in Barbuda. We couldn't yeah. even do that. Yeah. Well, what we have got a commitment on here is uh, at least the doubling of uh, finance to support countries. I, I, I know, but I'm asking you, why couldn't we set up that fund? 
Why couldn't we do that? Look, there is an adaptation fund uh, that uh, has had more money put into it. There's uh, a fund for the least developing countries. Again, more money went into it here at this COP. Uh, and, and if you look at the detail of what uh, uh, was agreed as well, there was a commitment in terms of channeling SDRs. I know it's sort of it's slightly technical, but you know, it makes a real difference. If you can get other ways getting funding into these climate vulnerable countries, we have to do that. And again, we've got agreement on that here. And finally, next year, in Sham, in Egypt, you've got to, particularly G20, bring back really updated, more powerful, more useful, frankly, um, contributions, NDCs, as you call them, to stop climate change. Well, we know, because we are led by the science, is that uh, the world needs to uh, halve its climate emissions by 2030. We are not there yet. We are on the way, but we are absolutely not there yet. And yes, so countries are going to have to come back and look at this issue. And I can assure you, in our presence here, we're going to continue to press on this. I'll hold you to it. Alec, Thank thanks you. very much indeed. Thanks, Appreciate Alex. your time. Thanks. That was the COP president, Alex Sharma, speaking to Alex Thompson in Glasgow. But let's get some analysis from our climate reporter, Simon Roach, also in Glasgow. Simon, lay it out for us. Well, yes, a, a revealing interview from Alex Sharma there. And, of course, there's no escaping the, the fact that, yes, India and China are slowing down decarbonisation efforts. But some context here is really important uh, because neither country are actually uh, ideologically opposed to steeper emissions cuts. Yet for them, this is actually just about finance and fairness. Um, of course, because the agreement that they were looking at yesterday doesn't mention oil and gas, just coal, which they use a lot more, the burden of decarbonisation falls much more heavily on them in the next few years. So for them, that's not necessarily fair. And then with finance, we often hear about this $100 billion of uh, climate finance promise that's still not been met. And yet researchers say that by 2030, we're actually going to need $5 trillion per year. That's 50 times more than we're currently failing to give. So yes, India and China are slowing things down, but the dynamic of power in these conferences has always been poor countries saying, look, we would decarbonize tomorrow if uh, centuries of exploitative history cannot be erased but at least addressed by finance today, and they say that's still not happening. Briefly, COP26 is over. What next? Well, yes, I mean, one of the ostensible achievements of this agreement was actually saying that none of this is enough. So next year, they come back with steeper emissions cuts at COP27. And crucially, poor countries are expecting more cash for loss and damage. That's climate impacts already here. These two things are going to be key, not just in the year ahead, but the months as well. 